Hello, today we would speak with Tom. He has a YouTube channel and he is a value investor from New Zealand. This video would be most interesting for new investors into a stock market. Uh, in his channel he explains a lot about uh, different concepts about investing and in this podcast we would briefly discuss some of them and you would be able to find extra informational support or extra investing ideas watching this video. Uh, please like, subscribe and feel free to ask any questions. Yeah, so hi again, Tom. And today hi. we have uh, Tom here. He is the investor from New Zealand. And how is New Zealand? Yeah, yeah, I appreciate having me on, Daniel. Um, it's going pretty well over here. We've been kind of semi back to normal for a little while now. So pretty, pretty lucky to be living in this part of the world at the moment, I think. And uh, I mean, uh, regarding the unemployment rate, is it also getting back to, to, to pretty normal? Because I believe tourism should be a um, part of the New Zealand economy. Yeah, tourism and agriculture are sort of first and second. So tourism's basically, well, tourism's getting hammered at the moment. That's a lot of them are kind of really struggling. And then um, agriculture is sort of, sort of just doing its thing still. So um, yeah, the unemployment's definitely still higher than usual. And I think getting back on track, but um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see because um, yeah, tourism's huge in New Zealand. So they're going to have to open the borders at some point if that's ever going to come back. So it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. There's a lot of people, you know, kind of in office jobs like me that are fairly back to normal. And then a lot of people are still struggling. So Mm -hmm. I see. I me, I used to work uh, as the director of the tourism company myself before COVID. Uh, okay. There is also no drop in our sector here. Yeah. Um, you have a YouTube channel. Can you please tell us a bit more about your YouTube channel and what is it about? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, so I've, um, I've got a YouTube channel called Investing with Tom. Um, basically, I talk about all things stock market related, a little bit of sort of personal finance and just sort of side hustles and saving more money and that kind of thing, but largely stock market focused. Um, mm -hmm. I'm based down in New Zealand. So we've got a pretty, it's a pretty unique kind of niche of stock market investor down in New Zealand. A lot of the investors in this part of the world are very focused on property investing. So mm -hmm. stock market's a little bit of a new topic for many people in New Zealand, but um, it's getting more and more popular. And I've been running the YouTube channel for um, getting pretty close to two years now, actually. And just, and, in sort of 2020, it started to kind of grow really well. We just had a thousand subscribers probably last November or December. And I think we're about 15,000 or so now um, and building up a nice little community there. So uh, yeah, that's, that's a bit about me. And uh, why did you decide to start? To, to yeah, there's, yeah, there's probably a few reasons. If I'm being honest, I, I had seen other people sort of start finance YouTube channels and see them kind of make it into a little bit of a, like a side income source. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So that was definitely one of the reasons. I mean, if that was the only reason I started it, I probably would have given up a lot earlier because I don't think I made any money at all for over a year. <laughs> so uh, it's definitely not super lucrative when you first get started, but um, that was one reason definitely. And then the other reason is just, I find it really interesting how much you can sort of how much you can learn from just talking to a camera. It's one thing to think you understand something and can have a certain idea in your head, but when, then when you try and explain it to someone else or, or explain it to a camera, you learn fairly quickly whether you understand something or not. So it's been quite a cool learning experience um, for myself just to you know, clarify a lot of the ideas I have about how to go about investing or saving money or whatever it might be by just talking to a camera and then um, have met a lot of people through YouTube as well. Like we obviously wouldn't be doing this podcast if, if I hadn't started true. the channel and I've met lots of people, um, other YouTubers, subscribers, um, all sorts of really great people in that community. So um, yeah, those are a few reasons that I started and I, that all kind of keeps me going now. Okay. And uh, the next question would be that, how did you get into the investing world? And can you just tell us about a little bit more about yourself? your professional life, what you do, what you've been doing before. Yep. Yeah, sure. So I have a, I have a, a sort of day job that has nothing to do with investing at all. So I, um, I studied a Bachelor of Agricultural Science when I first mm -hmm. left, um, left school and went off to university. Um, 
and then I've been working in the agricultural industry for coming up about four years now since mm. since leaving uni. So um, I work for sort of like an agricultural software company, um, do a bit of business development, run some some workshops for farmers and do some different things there. Um, so yeah, that's that's quite different to what I do on the YouTube channel. But but uh, I guess in terms of getting started with investing, I was essentially starting my job and then like a lot of students here in New Zealand had um, had built up a bit, a bit of a student loan from going to university for four years and was trying to figure out, you know, how do I, how do I, um, you know, grow my savings into something more substantial because I did some fairly quick just back of the envelope maths and said, you know, if I earn X amount during my lifetime and I save X percentage, um, if I don't make any sort of return on that money, it's not going to look very flash in a couple of decades when I try to retire. So um, I think I had about $5,000 saved up roughly, nothing nothing crazy. And I was sort of looking for something to, to do with it. Like I wasn't in a position to get into property investing or anything like that. And then the stock market, you know, discovered that whole world as kind of the next alternative where you can get in with smaller amounts of money and that sort of thing. And you know, really enjoyed it, developed a passion for it. And it's um, something I spend a lot of time looking into and, and talking about now. So that's, uh, yeah, that's how I got started. And I've, I've been investing for probably about three and a half years, something like that at three this point. Years. And what do you think is more exciting about it, most exciting about it? Yeah, so I find the stock market really interesting because it's got so many different types of businesses. It's like a very diverse place to put your money to work. Um, you know, if I look at my portfolio at, at the moment and companies that are kind of on my watch list of stocks that I'm looking at, there's anything from technology businesses to, you know, heavy industries, um, working in steel production or, uh, manufacturing vehicles, there's real estate in there. There's all sorts of different asset classes. Um, and I just find the process of getting my head around different types of businesses and trying to understand what the future looks like for them are uh, really interesting. Whereas if you look at, you know, more traditional investors in New Zealand looking just purely at maybe like rental properties, for example, um, I don't find that quite as exciting as, you know, looking at, at many different types of companies in the stock market. So basically, yeah, uh, stock market is a lot of varieties and basically it's for everyone, whether you understand tourism or whether you understand uh, airlines, you, you can basically find the stock for, your, for yourself. Mm -hmm. And the stock market, how, how do you start there? Like, what do you have to do? Maybe what, what sort of money do you have to start with? Because all of those, I, I want to build this video and this podcast kind of for 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 new uh, people that want to start in the stock market and and target this video towards you know towards this particular audience. Yeah. So we want to be speaking like a lot of people. They have you know biases whether like oh they're gonna lose money right away and you know like how do they start and uh, those are the questions that that I think. Uh, we need to discuss a uh, first uh, first thing. Yeah, yeah, sure. So I think um, there's a lot of different strategies when it comes to stock market investing. So, um, you know, if you ask some different stock market investors, they'll have probably different perspectives on this, but I'll, I'll give you mine as a starting point. Um, so mine is essentially looking at you know, the stock market being a collection of businesses. And when you buy shares, um, when you when you buy a stock, you're buying a small fraction of ownership in that business. And that's mm -hmm. basically the way that you should treat that as an investment. So, you, you know, you a lot of people like to look at a stock chart, for example, and just see that it's either going up or going down and kind of make decisions off that. Um, whereas the way I'm approaching it is I'm looking at, okay, what is the what does the business do? How do they make money? Is there, um, you know, if we take a, a company like Apple, for example, which is one of the largest, if not the largest publicly traded company in the world, we can look at, um, you know, do, how well do you understand Apple's business? You know, they make this much from selling iPhones. They, they make X amount of money from their different services that they have. 
um, you know, how well do you think Apple can grow out into the future? Um, do you think they're going to decline in the future? Um, just trying to think through as more of a business owner rather than someone just looking at a chart and seeing whether that is going to go up, up or down. Um, and then basically just trying to figure out a rational price to pay for that business, treating mm -hmm. it a little bit like you might treat a rental property. So, you know, saying, uh, these numbers are not accurate, but let's say Apple produces a thousand dollars a year in cash flows and mm -hmm. profit. Um, then looking at you know what's a what's a reasonable price to pay for that thousand dollars in cash flow. If it was a rental property that produced a thousand dollars, you probably wouldn't go out and pay ten billion dollars for it because that's not a very attractive return on your ten billion dollars. If um, you are but, if you are in Vancouver, you probably you probably would have to do it. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. It's a little <laughs> bit like that here. Yeah, it's a little bit like that here as well, actually. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, cause so I mean, it's basically treating it like a business. Um, there's all sorts of different companies on the stock market. Um, and I think you're right, people do get kind of scared of perhaps losing money. Um, so I think it, it pays to be long term focused as well. So, um, you know, sco stocks can do anything in the short term. If you buy into Apple, it can go down 10% tomorrow without any warning. But the important thing is to understand, you know, you're getting that thousand dollars in cash flow and you paid a reasonable price for it. If you paid a reasonable price for it, then you're going to be okay in the long run, uh, mm -hmm. assuming that you bought a good business and you were, you were right with your sort of theory on what you think that company is going to do in the future. Okay. Uh, I kind of use the same strategy, being honest, when I invest. So I can tell that this strategy is uh, basically super proven and a lot of, you know, high, high, uh, really good investors, they're also value investors and yeah. it's kind of the, the, the strategy that they use as well. So you choose yeah. companies and then you basically wait and then they grow, uh, kind of. Yeah, if, exactly. If, 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 to be super simple. And the uh, next question is how do prices form on the stock exchange? Let's say, how, how is it determined that it's exactly I don't know, $300 or $200 or what's the driven force behind it? Yeah, that's a really interesting question because I guess, um, you know, when I'm thinking about it, like we we're just talking about, I'm thinking about trying to buy partial ownership in a business and um, they're always sort of approximations. You, you can't really, although you can put numbers into an Excel spreadsheet, for example, you're not going to be able to calculate what a company is worth down to three decimal places or anything and have a huge degree of confidence in that. But somehow the market does land on these very precise sort of prices. So, mm -hmm. I mean, basically the stock market is auction driven. So there's a, there's a collection of, of buyers and sellers on every, any given day in the stock market um, or for a particular company, I should say. And, you know, if there's more buyers than sellers, then the price will tend to go up. If there's more sellers than buyers, the price will tend to go down. Um, and in the short term, that's basically what drives it is just how many people are trying to buy or sell shares of that particular company on a given day. Um, and that can create dramatic price swings. But over the long term, we know that prices basically follow the underlying value of the business. So although stocks fluctuate a lot day to day, um, if a company triples its profitability over 10 years, you can expect that the stock is probably going to roughly do about the same over 10 years, assuming that uh, you didn't buy it in a bubble or, you know, you may do even better than that if you bought it at really distressed valuations for, for some reason. But by and large, that's kind of the way that prices work over the long term, whereas the short term, it's just whatever, you know, people are up to on that day really can impact the price. And a lot of people I know, they have a question about why stock prices are growing and why markets are growing. What's the main concept behind uh, this idea? Cause, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, sure. So I guess um, anything can happen in the short term again. Like if we go back to, if we go back to March when the whole pandemic was starting, um, there were a lot of people scared that, you know, the stock market was going to crash and it was sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy because they thought it was going to crash. So they sold and then they saw it going down because people were selling and, you know, it just kind of goes on and on and on. Um, so you can get these short term, you know, drops or um, huge increases, you know, you get people with um, not to call out all the Tesla investors out there, but you get people, you know, seeing Tesla triple in a month and, 
you know, they get fear of missing out and they just follow the the price. And again, it's a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, but in terms of what causes stock market growth over the long term, in my opinion, there's basically two main factors. So the first mm -hmm. one is, again, thinking of the stock market as a collection of businesses. Um, basically, the businesses become more valuable over time. They produce more money. Um, and people are willing to pay a greater price for that collection of businesses because the businesses are more profitable. So mm -hmm. that's, that's basically the first core idea. Uh, and the second one, which we've seen probably quite a lot of over the last maybe 10 or 15 years is to do with uh, interest rates actually have a really big impact on, on the stock market as well. So, you know, if you think about, if you think about maybe again, buying this, um, this hypothetical com company that makes a thousand dollars of profit a year. Um, if you can put your money into the bank, into a, you know, zero risk kind of savings account type thing and get 10% interest on that per year, um, then you're probably not going to buy into a business that's going to yield you 10%. So you probably mm -hmm. wouldn't pay, for example, $10,000 for that business that's going to produce the a thousand dollars and get you that 10% return. Um, but if interest rates are 1%, then mm -hmm. all of a sudden that 10% yield from a business looks really, really attractive. So, you know, what we've seen over the last 10 or 15 years, interest rates have just steadily gone down in many countries, they're zero or even negative. Um, even in really good economies, they're getting pretty close to zero. And that's driven stocks up quite a lot as well, because, uh, you know, people are having to be pushed sort of up the risk spectrum or up the risk scale in order to get a reasonable return on their money. That's really good two points. I think people should, those are like, I would, I would say those are kind of the basic ones, uh, yeah. the fundamentals. Um, and when is the good time to start? Now is COVID, no one really knows what's going on. It's super uncertain. Is yeah. it like going to go all crazy or are we going to go sky high because of, you know, all those new crazy technologies. Is it a good time to start right now? Should we wait? What should we do? Uh, yeah, so I think uh, the first thing to point out is, um, you know, there's a lot of information and in investing that's really important, like interest rates or earnings growth, like we just talked about. Um, and there's also a lot of information that's not knowable. So <laughs> where the market is going to be in a month or two, no one has any idea. And I think if you did have an, an idea, you'd be very rich very quickly if you're able to predict that kind of yeah. stuff. So what I would say to that question is in the short term, anything could happen. You know, the stock market could double in a year. Um, it could go down 80%. It could do any range of things in the middle of that. You know, no one quite knows. Um, but what I would say is, is a, as an investor, it's important to understand your time horizon. So if you look at very long term data, um, almost every study you find will suggest that the stock market has the best long term returns. So if you're looking to put money to work for 10, 20, 30, 40 years uh, that you're not going to touch through it throughout that entire period, there's probably not too many better alternatives than investing in businesses, investing in the stock market. Um, but if you're someone that's, you know, saving up a house deposit, for example, and you're going to need that cash next year to buy your first home, um, the stock market probably isn't the place to, to put your money. You know, you might be reaching for maybe a, an 8 or 10% return, but putting that money at risk of going down 50% and all of a sudden, you know, you don't have that cash available. So, um, yeah, what happens in the short term, I don't know. I think over time, over a long period of time, the world and businesses will become more profitable like they have done for the last couple of centuries. Um, but it really depends on your time horizon as to whether it's a good time for you to get started or not. I want to speak about current technological world. Uh, basically, how do you think, um, is there any, 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 any sort of ideas how it's all going to develop? Because all of, all of those big companies, they're kind of forming uh, the big uh, conglomerates and they're trying to, you know, get every sphere of life. Like let's say Amazon, they're delivering parcels and they're making products and then they're building some drones and then they're working on AI and they're selling it online and Google kind of does same idea. And then Facebook does the same idea. Like they have whole ecosystem. And basically to me, future looks like where there is only few big corporations 
and you know you you either have option to go to Google or to Facebook, but uh, uh, predominantly you can do the same thing, same thing over all of those corporations. And small businesses are, you know, getting harder and harder to get through this, through this point to be competitive. And uh, that's really bad for investing into the new companies and new businesses. And what do you think from your perspective, how does it look? How does the future look? Yeah, it's really interesting. I think um, from an investor's perspective, um, you basically want to buy into businesses um, that are essentially monopolies. They have some sort of competitive advantage that just puts them well ahead of the competition. Maybe they can produce some sort of widget at a far lower price than all the competitors. They can undercut on price, undercut their competitors on price, and they can generate, you know, far better returns than the other businesses. So. That's sort of the investor side of it. And then you've also got the consumer side, which is basically if there are a bunch of businesses that are essentially monopolies, then um, the, there's not a bunch of different companies battling it out for price. And all of a sudden you're paying more for goods and services that you than you otherwise would if there were lots of companies competing against each other. So I kind of think that if they're left to continue onwards, a lot of these big companies will continue to build out their ecosystem and they will, you know, either just completely outperform their competitors or they might even just keep buying out their competitors to sort of kill off that competition. Um, and if that continues to happen, I think investors, if they can buy into those businesses at reasonable prices will probably do quite well. Um, but then the other side of it is if those companies get to a point where they just own the world. <laughs> um, I think there's a bit of a risk of, you know, governments potentially getting in and breaking those things up and um, doing a little bit like they did to sort of, uh, you know, John D. Rockefeller with Standard Oil, you know, breaking mm -hmm. the company up in order to to get more competition and try and eliminate these monopolies. So it could go either way. Um, if, if that's a call that you're having to make as an investor, I think, um, I'd prefer to be in companies where, where that, it, you know, trying to decide which one of those outcomes is most realistic is not a problem. So, yeah. um, you know, maybe you're able to get into a business where there's three or four main competitors and they all have a reasonable market share and they all generate reasonable profits. Or maybe you are able to get into a Google type company and uh, you get them, you get shares in the business at such a cheap price because of some market fluctuation, like in March, for example, that, you know, either of those outcomes, even if it, even if they do get broken up, you make good returns. So um, who knows which way it will go, but um, there's a whole range of outcomes for there, but no doubt they've been consuming the, the market the, the last five or 10 years. And, and a lot of people have made a lot of money out of it. And what do you think like top five, maybe four uh, concepts that are, super important for uh, new investors. I mean, a couple of them we already spoke, is a long-term yep. uh, mindset. And what are other ones? That yeah, sure. So I go, I kind of go back to, um, all the way back to a guy called Ben Graham. So you might know who he is, but yeah. a lot of the newer investors may not. So Ben Graham was um, Warren Buffett's teacher um, uh -huh. at Columbia University and sort of the, the dean of value investing as they called him. Um, so I think a lot of his core principles still kind of stand. So, um, you know, a stock is a piece of ownership in a business. It's not a piece of paper or in this case, a digital chart that moves around. <laughs> um, um, so yeah, a stock is ownership in a business. Um, your returns over the long term are going to be driven by those business results. So if you buy into good companies at good prices, you'll probably do pretty well. Um, and then there's a couple of other core ideas from Ben Graham that I still think really still work today as well. So um, those ideas are basically um, the market is there to serve you, not to instruct you. So in other words, you should be looking at stocks as a business and trying to put a, a reasonable value on that business. And then the market fluctuates wildly in and around that value. And if you're able to, to purchase companies at less than that value, you can you know, secure really attractive returns. And that goes on to his final concept, which is, um, which is margin of safety. So if you can 
um, buy into a business at dramatically less than it's worth, let's say you think a business is worth $100 and you can buy it for 50, um, then two things kind of happen. The first thing is if you secure a price of 50 and you think it's worth 100, um, if the value of if the price of the business in the market um, goes back to what it should be fairly valued at, then you've doubled your money, you've made a really good return. Um, and the other thing is if the business doesn't perform as well as you'd hoped and you know although you thought it was a hun worth 100 maybe it's actually not worth 100 because it hasn't been as profitable out into the future as you might have first thought then you've protected your downside because you've been able to purchase it at well below that value so um those are a couple of core ideas and i think those you know those were all true 50 years ago or more and they're just as true today <laughs> And uh, you, you mentioned Benjamin Graham, and who, who, what other books you might recommend to people who would view this video? Yeah, sure. So I read, um, I read The Intelligent Investor by Ben Graham. I think that was like the second book, not even on stock market investing, but the second book on money that I ever read, um, which I think was a mistake. It was just over my head at <laughs> that early in the stage. But if you've already got some, some sort of interest in stock market investing, um, that is still a, a good place to go. I think some of the information in there on bonds and things like that are a little bit outdated, but the core principles of, you know, some of the stuff I just spoke about definitely still stand. Um, some of the other books, if you're looking for something a little bit more beginner focused, um, I really like Phil Town's books. So uh, Rule One by Phil Town, um, Payback Time, and what's his third one? Invested, that's just come out in the last couple of years are really good. Um, those are much more beginner focused and Phil Town's sort of the first person that I that I read or watched his videos that um, sort of took Warren Buffett and Ben Graham's investment philosophy and put it into sort of practical steps in terms of how to go through an investment process and understand a business and and try to put a value on. So um, those would be a couple of starting points. And then um, there's a couple of others that I really like. The Dando Investor by Monas Pabrai is really good. Um, and then I'm just looking at my bookshelf at the moment. So um, probably something if you're looking to get into more so kind of long-term growth type businesses, you know, one decision type stocks, we can buy it and just hold it for 20 years. Um, there's a book called 100 Baggers by Chris Mayer. Um, 100 Bagger oh. being a stock that goes up 100 times over a long period of time that's a really good book it basically is a case study of i think something like 300 businesses over the last 50 years that turned out to be 100 baggers and some of the characteristics within each of those businesses so th those are a few to keep the watchers busy behavior wise i want to speak about behavior in the market because mm -hmm. i believe is uh, it's it, it's one of the most important uh, topics is to have a proper mindset Yep. Let's uh, maybe give a few uh, tips for people who just want to start. What's what's behind this concept? Yeah, sure. So I will say that um, the mindset part is something that's developed for me over a period of time. So when I first started, I was one of the people that bought shares for the first time. And then the next day I was checking the price every five minutes and saying, you know, it was a tiny investment, but I was saying, you know, I've made a dollar, I've lost $2, I've made $10 or whatever and just watching it all day long. Uh, that is not good for your financial health. So I think there's a few things that, that you should do. So um, we've kind of touched on a lot of them already, but definitely be long-term focused. Um, and I think one of the things that has helped me the most by far is just thinking of uh, a stock as a piece of ownership in a company and, you know, mm -hmm. thinking that you know, let's say you owned a house, for example, you just bought a house for $500,000, um, for example, and then, you know, you're pretty comfortable with that price, it's going to be a rental property, and it's going to make you $50,000 a year in cash flows, you're going to get a nice 10% return on that, um, on that investment, which is really good for most parts of the world. Um, and sounds like that would be amazing for where you're living at the moment, Daniel. Um, you know, if, if someone came up to you the next week and offered you $300,000 for their house, it would be stupid of you to say no. Uh, sorry, it would be stupid of you to say yes, rather. You that's should not true. sell that house that's for $300,000. Really um, because the business or the rental property is producing the cash flows, you got a good price, you know that it's worth at least 500000 probably even more because a 10% yield is amazing on a you know good rental property. Um, so it's important to be confident in 
the business results and understand what you think a business is actually worth and not focus so much on just the market quotation, you know, quoting you a lower or, or higher price. Um, that's quoting you a higher price, maybe that is an opportunity to sell. That's quoting you a lower price and you're really, you know, comfortable with your valuations. It might be an opportunity to get that larger margin of safety and continue purchasing. So, um, yeah, in terms of mindset, treat it like a business, you know, know within a certain range what you think a company's worth and just kind of stick to those things. Um, and if you can ignore all the noise and daily fluctuations and stuff and, and just focus on that, I think you'll do well. Yeah, big lesson uh, in that regards happen here in Canada. We have a local insurance company, actually a government insurance company. And they have a, a huge fund where they, you know, buy stocks for, for extra dollars that they have from their clients. Yep. And uh, when the market went down, they actually sold all the stocks and lost $3 billion on this. And this is not how you're supposed to <laughs> behave in the Aye. situations. Yeah, I really did an approach towards long term can help uh, a lot of people out, you know, to... To, to, to overcome shorter waves. Yeah, yeah, and, and just probably one last thing I'd say on that is, um, you know, it's easy to say that you're long-term focused, um, but I think it's important to genuinely be long-term focused. I think it's yeah. amazing how quickly people can switch from, you know, I'm a long term, if the stock market's going up in a straight line, they're all, you know, I'm, I'm long-term investors, I'm never gonna sell this, I'll just continue to hold it. And then, you know, if we have something like March and the, and the market goes down 30% in a month, all of a sudden people are thinking a lot more about tomorrow than they are 20 years, uh, like, they, like they were when the market's going up. So if you do consider yourself a long-term investor, um, you know, make sure that you genuinely in your heart believe that and can, can, can hang on when prices do actually uh, fluctuate downwards quite a bit, because that does happen fairly sure. frequently. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Um, and COVID-19 right now, what do you think we should do? How, what, what companies to buy maybe, what sort of strategy to, to, to think? Also elections are, you know, happening right now, which is also given some sort of uncertainty into the situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So I think, um, I probably can't give you too many specific companies just because every person is going to understand a gr certain group of businesses differently. You know, I have a reasonable number of agricultural companies on my watch list, for example, because that's the mm -hmm. area I work in. You know, you work in, uh, or you used to work in tourism. So, you know, those... I don't have any tourism companies right now. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think I read a, Le a Peter Lynch book and he said, it's amazing how many, um, how many doctors and, you know, um, uh, and so on will invest in steel companies and then how many steel workers will invest in biotechnology. It seems yeah, very backwards. Is, so, yeah, yeah. so yeah, to focus on the areas that you know, um, but I mean, gen general, general things I'm looking at, particularly at the moment, there's a lot of companies with massive amounts of debt. So looking for healthy balance sheets, um, if you're not a, an accountant or anything, basically a balance sheet's just looking at the assets and the liabilities for the company. Yeah. So, you know, you own a million dollar house, you've got half a million dollars in mortgage, then you have half a million dollars in equity as well. So trying to understand that for a uh, business. Do, also. You have, do you have a video about balance sheets on your uh, channel? Uh, Financials? I don't, how, think how, I, how I don't think I do actually. Maybe that's hmm. something I should, I should put together. Uh, yeah, I'll give a shout out. Yeah, I might give a quick shout out to a, there's an Australian guy on YouTube called Hamish Hodder. I think if anyone checks out his channel, he's got videos on all three financial statements. So uh -huh, that uh -huh. might be a good place to start. But yeah, definitely looking for, you know, healthy cash positions and just making sure that companies can survive and pay their debts uh, and so on. I mean, if you look at something in the tourism industry, for example, at the moment, a lot of those businesses are getting really beaten up and they probably will for a period of time. Um, and that does potentially create an opportunity to get a margin of safety and buy businesses really cheap. Um, but you have to make sure that they can make it through the dark times. You have to make sure that, you know, they can survive these bad years so that when they come out the other side, you know, they do genuinely, they do actually come out the other side. They haven't gone bankrupt in the meantime. Um, so those are some, some, some things I'm looking at. I think we've seen a lot of technology kind of um, adoption brought forward. So, um, 
I think I'd barely used Zoom by before February or March. So now I've used it all the time. So, you know, um, that's not a recommendation to buy Zoom because the price is through the roof. Um, every yeah, time I seem true. to look at it, but you know, there's, there's things that, that may be in your industry as well that you see have been really pulled forward and, um, more broadly accepted a lot quicker than they might've otherwise been. So there's potentially some opportunities to look there. Um, and again, I think just, you know, looking at, looking at good quality businesses and trying to get decent prices for them. Cause I do think there is actually quite a few opportunities out there at the moment. Like we do have a small selection of businesses, like really anything roughly related to technology seems to have done really well and have a really high price. Um, but everything that isn't in that camp, there's a lot of really beaten up businesses that still actually might be performing okay, um, but the price just hasn't recovered as well since you know the March um, March mm -hmm. dips and everything. So, um, yeah, depending on where you're confident in terms of understanding what a company does, there'll be different areas that you look at. But making sure a business can survive and um, you know trying to lock in that margin of safety would be my main two two points okay this is actually super interesting few minutes that we've spent together it's already been 40 minutes that we're here together on the <laughs> conversation time flies pretty pretty quick it does um i believe we would finish on this maybe a couple final words that you want to give as the motivation or as just you know final advice yeah sure um if anyone's come across from my channel because i'll share this on my community post subscribe to daniel uh, that's my first recommendation and then um yeah i think um i think it takes a while to sort of learn the process of investing but very long term the stock market has has been a great performer so if you've got money that you don't need for 20 years it's probably not a bad place to start looking um and yeah i've probably said it 10 times already but treat stocks like businesses and uh, you know, try and buy them at reasonable prices, just like you would a rental property and you'll, you'll do well. That's good. And I'll going to be sharing the link to a couple of your videos that I personally watched and I personally really like, and yeah, I guess. Appreciate it. We would finish our recording here. Cool.